Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Tom for that overly generous introduction, and to thank you all for coming in your postprandial haze to my lecture. Um, I will attempt to be a cup of coffee for you and um, get you excited about working on this disease, which is a bad one. Um, and I'm very honored to be here. I first time to uh, this part of the world, and I'm learning a little bit of vocabulary. So my title slide with my laboratory is saying hello to you, assalamu alaikum. So this is a picture of Cold Spring Harbor um, in the autumn, uh, and the laboratories are on the hillside. And it's a great place to think hard about bad uh, medical problems. Um, you fellows in the back should start the clock. The Olympics have started. Um, and so I'm going to talk about these new model systems that we, um, we use to uh, go after this disease called organoids. Um, I've worked with a variety of uh, corporations over the years trying to get them to work on pancreas cancer, develop drugs against this disease. It hasn't worked so far, uh, but uh, we keep trying. Um, we get a little bit of support from a few of them listed on top, but nothing substantive. Most of our support comes from governmental agencies such as the NIH as well as the Les Garden Foundation. And all of this is motivated by contact we have with patients, either myself or those who come to uh, see us in our lab. So this is the slide I want you to remember, if you don't remember anything else about uh, my seminar. This is the expected mortality due to cancer in the US, and it's thought to be similar uh, for the rest of the world. So these are uh, types of cancer that will uh, kill patients, and most of them are doing better except for pancreatic cancer, which is skyrocketing. And really, if you were to think about it as any other type of disease, you would call this an epidemic. Uh, and this is a huge problem. This is a projection, but so far the uh, calculations have looked uh, accurate. And so why is that? And what can we do better about this disease? Well, there's a multiple things about pancreas cancer that make it tough. Uh, it's like hepatitis before finding the virus. You know, we need much better ways to treat this disease. Uh, so when patients come to our, our attention, it's because their loved ones say, honey, your eyes look yellow. And that's actually what happens a third of the time. People are picked up because someone close to them notices that they're jaundiced. They have scleral icterus. When they go to medical attention, about half of them have metastatic pancreas cancer. So they're the blue part of that pie. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to push this button without the eject part. OK, so this is not going to work much. But more than half have metastases, and a, a quarter have advanced disease, so a surgeon can operate. The other quarter can go to Kevin Conlon's clinic and, and get a proper operation. And they have the best chance of surviving. About a quarter of the people Kevin operates on are alive five years later, but all the other categories, very few people survive. So what is it about this disease that makes it so bad, and why is it happening more frequently, et cetera? What we know about the disease through the work of Bert Fogelstein, Scott Kern, Andrew Biancan, many others, is that there are mutations in genes that cause pancreas cancer, just like other types of cancer. But pancreatic cancer is a little more boring than the other types of cancer. There is a predominant mutation in an oncogene called KRAS. And the boringness of that makes it impossible to solve. This is the Gordian knot of this disease. So this is the oncogene, the driver. And then there are multiple tumor suppressor genes mutated, P53, P16, SMAD4, part of the TGF beta pathway, and BRCA2. These are the somatic mutations we find in tumors. Occasionally, these mutations are found in the germline of families that have pancreas cancer, some of the tumor suppressor genes. And so it's a disease of mutations, just like other forms of cancer. We also know that pancreatic cancer derives itself from pre-invasive neoplasms. These are common. They're found on autopsy when they're low grade. But they're never found on autopsy when they're high grade. So the window between a high grade carcinoma in situ an invasive lethal cancer is very tiny. We don't have that population of patients like you have in prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, breast cancer. When it becomes a high-grade pre-invasive neoplasm, that's almost the same as invasive. So people do poorly. We also know that pancreatic cancer happens in times of inflammation. 
pancreatitis, damage to the pancreas caused by things we do to ourselves, tobacco, alcohol, or things that are not necessarily our fault, gallstones that reflux, scorpion bites that we pick up here and there, other toxins which we don't understand well, metabolic syndromes such as obesity, which are you know, rampant these days. And then finally, the last thing we know about pancreatic cancer, I mentioned already, there are families that have pancreatic cancer. These families oftentimes have mutations in the Fanconi anemia pathway genes, such as BRCA2. Sometimes they have familial atypical mole and melanoma syndrome because of P16 or CDK4 inherited germline uh, alleles. Occasionally they have Coit Jaeger's disease where they have an LKB1 mutation. And then finally, there's a syndrome called familial pancreatitis, where these patients have a mutation in a gene that is involved in the proteolysis of proteins. This mutation makes the, the protein hyperactive. These patients have pancreatitis. They get a hundredfold more pancreatic cancer than the rest of people. Really demonstrated that inflammation can cause pancreas cancer. So this is what we know about pancreas cancer. But the government of, of the U.S. got together about six years ago and, and tried to get their head around the cancers where we weren't making really any progress. And pancreatic cancer was on the top of the list, followed by lung cancer and finally ovarian cancer. And they called these cancers recalcitrant because no matter how many people they threw at the problem and how many dollars or euros or pounds or dramas they threw at the problem, nothing was helping. And they tried to come up with reasons why that may be. And I've listed some of the ones that I favor. I think number one is the patients are diagnosed late. And many carcinomas that are diagnosed as metastatic diseases, we have no curative approach for them unless immunotherapy works in those patients. The second, though, and I think a real problem in this disease is RAS mutant tumors, KRAS particularly, mutant cancers, don't respond well to th therapies when we treat patients. And then finally, something that Tom uh, introduced when he um, kindly uh, uh, brought me up here is that the pancreatic cancers are also drug resistant, we feel, because the tumor microenvironment is very unusual. It's a big scar. It's like a, a baseball or a, uh, a, a, a ball you would use in cricket, a hard ball with the cancer cell stuck in the middle. And you have to get your drugs through that hard cricket ball to, to hit the uh, cancer cells. Um, and so these are major problems we have in the disease. And so years back when I decided to study it, we knew we needed a plan. We needed a, a map to get us there. And uh, this is what we decided to do. One is we needed a model system. We couldn't study the disease in patients because they got sick so quickly, you couldn't learn much from them. You could learn to be a compassionate physician, which is fine, if, if that's really, in the end, all, all you want it to be. But I like to be compassionate, but also correct the problem. And so that was not in the cards back then. And so we needed models to study the disease. We couldn't just study it in patients or cells or slides that you would get from pathology. And we call these model systems the hardware on which we will develop the software. And so the model system should allow us to dig deep into the cancer, allow basic fundamental scientific observations so that we could figure out what it was made of. So then we could discover new therapies and new diagnostic methods for the disease. But once we had the model, what are we going to do with it? Well, obviously, we need to figure out a way to diagnose the disease early. We need biomarkers for the cancer. And this is essentially why we develop such models. Because if we have ways to find the cancer early, we send them to Kevin so we can operate or we send them to Sandy or somebody else, myself, in the medical oncology clinic so we can treat early. With these models, we could find new targets. I told you RAS was bad and we have no therapy for RAS. Well, RAS by itself is just naked. It will kill nothing. It needs help. It needs a posse or a whole, con a whole collection of individuals uh, in the cell to, kill, to actually be a bad oncogene. And so we could learn about new targets with these models to either treat the cancer or prevent it. And then finally, the whole point of this was to have better therapy so that when we meet a patient, we can say you used to have pancreatic cancer. We can't do that yet. So what are the models that we've had? We've had cells on the left to study this disease. We've made mouse models in the middle that uh, Tom introduced. And finally, we have our patients on the right who are, who are starting to enroll on clinical trials so that they can fight the disease too. 
when I started in this disease, there was nobody to talk to. Um, there was nowhere to go. There were very few papers to read about the disease. There were only three funded investigators at the NIH at the time, um, through the NIH. And so I was lucky to find a laboratory to do my postdoc in the mid-90s at Tyler Jack's lab, and we developed mouse models for pancreatic cancer. Fortunately, there were others who were also interested in this, and they're listed uh, below, uh, Rhonda Pino's lab, Mariana Barbacid, and Hal Moses. And what we did was we made a RAS allele that looked like the RAS allele you have in human pancreatic cancer, and we expressed it in the pancreas of the mouse, and we developed on the upper part of the slide um, early pre-invasive neoplasms called PANIN. Over a long period of time, those animals developed invasive cancers shown below that metastasized and killed the animal. And you can make this go faster by putting in one copy of those tumor suppressor genes I mentioned. And so this model became very useful in a variety of uh, uh, assays, as those listed on the right, to answer some of those questions that I, I discussed before. One of the main things we found, Tom mentioned, which is that the disease is a scar, and in the scar there are very few blood vessels, and therefore it's difficult to deliver drugs to those cancer cells. And so we developed this hypothesis by making the mouse model that this was the case. This slide is of human pancreatic cancer, just showing you that it is, in fact, a scar with very few blood vessels. And so that was one hypothesis that came of this. The second, I think, equally compelling hypothesis is that cancer cells that exist in a hypoxic environment are, are, are innately tough to kill. They have programs activated in them that are pro-survival, and they tend to be very drug resistant. Another thing we, we noticed uh, through the, this work in the mice is besides the drug delivery problem in the upper left, the stroma also provided a, a nursery blanket to cancer. It provided growth factors, su survival factors to the right, which made the cancer happy and made it survive in the desert. Um, and then below, we realized that the immune system was shunned by the cancer due, due to a variety of chemokines made by the stroma, as well as growth factors that attracted in immune suppressive cells, such as immature myelite cells. And so these all became potential therapeutic targets. This was all well and good, but this was 15 years of work. And in 15 years, millions of people died of pancreatic cancer. And so it was just too slow. And so we decided we had to go faster. And so while I was in uh, Europe, I, I got to know Hans Klevers very well. He was constantly uh, exciting me about his organoid systems that he used in the, to model the intestinal biology. Um, and eventually he got interested in pancreatic biology using it. His, uh, one of his star postdocs, Sylvia, worked with mine in order to develop organoid models of pancreas cancer. I should note that this was based upon the pioneering work of Hans's laboratory, where to the left of Hans, Hans is in the middle, to the left of him is Toshi, his, um, one of his uh, great postdocs who developed the model systems to look at various epithelial tissues. And next to Hans is Mary, Mary Hutch, who will give a presentation tomorrow about liver organoids and possibly pancreas. And this team of individuals really deserves the credit for the developing these models in mouse and then human tissues. They are uh, very illuminating in health and disease. So what we did um, uh, was essentially to model our work on Mary's uh, first paper and, and Sylvia's. Take a, a mouse on the left, which was normal, one in the middle, which had a pre-invasive neoplasm, just with a RAS mutation, one on the right that had a proper tumor. Very quickly get the ducts or the cancer out of it disaggregate it uh, biochemically and, and physically, and put it into a matrix gel, almost a jello type solution, and you would get these um, very ho hollow and uh, pleasing looking structures that would grow out in 48 to 72 hours, called organoids. And here's what it looks like up close. You can see the ducts in the, in the middle column from the tissue above um, and growing out very rapidly. And from a cancer, you don't pick the ducts, you have a, a, a heterogeneous cell population uh, and you use various factors to kill off the immune and stromal cells. But after 72 hours on the bottom, you see the organoids. So with these, the amazing thing about it is you can now study biology, biochemistry, molecular events, looking at non-transformed primary epithelial cells, comparing them to ones that carry mutations that are relevant in cancer. Such studies really have not been possible um, previously. And so if you were to study RAS, you know RAS is a G protein, binds GTP. It's a poor enzyme. 
Uh, when it's mutated, it binds GTP uh, more avidly. And you could show that comparing the first lane to the second, there's more uh, RAS GTP in these organoid cultures. And then, of course, you can look at any manner of molecular information. This is looking at gene expression, showing you in red that the organoids express genes that you know are present in these early pre-neoplasms in mice and humans. You can transplant these organoids back into the mouse pancreas and study the biology of the disease. We first marked these organoids with a fluorescent protein so we could see them later, showing you that when we put a normal organoid back in, it grew as a normal duct. When you put in a one that carries a RAS mutation back in, it grows out as a tannin or a pre-invasive neoplasm. The ability to model those early steps of neoplasia really, I don't think, has, has been uh, shown to be as robust as, as in this case uh, by prior work from others. When you transplant it, you get that hard cricket ball structure around the cancers. So they're desmoplastic, they're a scar tissue. And these colors uh, using the dyes invented by the German pathologists in the 1800s uh, demonstrate that by Mason's trichrome uh, staining. As you would imagine, you could study anything you want in these culture systems. This is one such example looking at RNA expression, comparing normal on the left to a RAS mutation only in the middle, that's a panin organoid, to a cancer on the right, showing you there were stages of progression at a molecular level. You could look at the data in a different way and actually hone in on one particular set of genes, in this case, nuclear porins, which are very important uh, and, and nuclear transport, showing you that they were very enriched in the cancer compared to the other two states. You could look at the various genes you identify and ask in real tissue from mice, is it true that you see an increase in expression of those genes? And here are several that had been described before, which um, were, were correctly identified. And you can look at the same three in the human and get the same information. The reason for showing you this is that we rarely, if ever, find something in organoids that is not true in the in vivo setting. We're over 90% accurate on all the various things we've found to date, looking at gene expression, protein expression, biochemical pathways, immunologic uh, criteria, et cetera. So we could do the same thing in humans. You can take a normal pancreas on the left, which would be in the US a motorcycle accident victim. I don't know what it would be over here um, uh, in the UAE. These are uh, pancreases which are donated to islet transplant centers, and after they were done looking for islets, we would get the discarded acinar and ductal tissue. In the middle are the patients Kevin uh, Conlon operates on, if you will follow me, and on the right are those patients who couldn't go to surgery because their tumor was too advanced, either too metastatic or too large, wrapped around the great vessels, where a small biopsy from a tiny needle was sufficient to grow these organoids, and this is what it looks like. Normal on the left, tumor in the middle, fine needle aspirates from advanced tumors on the right. And it works most of the time. In fact, those little tiny biopsies work the best, probably because they go from the tumor into our tube and they're rapidly resuscitated. We can take those human organoids and transplant them back in, just like the mouse. And when we make it from a tumor, we can watch the stages of progression, which again is, is pretty amazing because there's no model of human preneoplasia of the pancreas that you could study. And this is obviously the state you wanna find those biomarkers of early cancer and treat that cancer early, et cetera. And so we're quite um, excited about this model and using it uh, for a variety of our discovery-based approaches. And so at the end of this, the question is, did we find something huge or did we find a sea cucumber? Um, and so I use this term up here because on my way, uh, after arriving, I heard that before oil, um, the UAE was uh, big into fishing and collecting pearls, and you would trade these pearls to India for rupees. Well, um, sometimes when you went down to the bottom to find the pearls, you probably didn't find them. You found something that was worth nothing, and so that's what bycatch is. Uh, so the question, though, that we have is, are we onto something really big or is this just a mess? So this is a picture um, that looks a little bit like the fancy trophies that we got yesterday on the top of it, um, where you have neoplastic organoid cells in red intermingled with wild type, normal ductal epithelial cells in green. And they're touching each other in this chimeric organoid. And again, visualize this as you know, the way to find 
how to deconvolute this problem. If you had a great therapy, it would make the red cells go away and the green cells would remain. If you had a great diagnostic, it would pick up the red cells but not the green cells, for example. And I'll show you examples of how we're using that analogy to push this. So this is Herve Tyriac, and he has caught an actual uh, fish. This is a summer flounder in Long Island called uh, Paralyctius uh, dentatus. Uh, they're like Dover sole. They taste uh, very, very scrumptious. His job has been to ask, can the organoids help human patients? And so to do so, we had to do quality assessment, quality control of the organoids. We had to ask, if you find a mutation in the organoid and you go back to that patient's tumor, are those mu same mutations in the tumor? Also, if you made an organoid today and grew it and passaged it for weeks and months or years, would it be the same organoid at the end at, that you started out with? And then finally, could we do this so we could actually help patients? Is it, are we fast enough? Are we, are we successful enough in generating them to help a patient during their lifespan of fighting pancreas cancer? And then, of course, if we find a drug in the organoid, is that what the patient's tumor responds to when the doctor treats them? And then the last point we haven't gotten to at all, but scalability. How can we roll this out as something to treat all patients? Or is this going to be some fancy boutique science driven uh, enterprise, which in the end of the day doesn't you know, help society, which would be a failure. Um, so this is one of the first comparisons. Look at the bottom, where you don't see a lot going on. This is doing copy number analysis of a tumor where you were to laser capture cancer cells from that tumor by very carefully encircling them and popping them out, getting the DNA, asking where you have gains and losses of that DNA. Or on the top, taking that same tumor and generating organoids, and in the first passage, getting single nuclei of epithelial cells and asking, where is the DNA gained and lost? And so on the bottom, there's not a lot going on. Uh, but there's uh, two gains and one loss. And on the top, there's a lot going on. And those gains and losses you saw on the bottom are there, and they're very evident. And you see a lot of other things, too. So at least at this very superficial level, it looks like you know, we're seeing some things in the nuclei of organoids that you would see in the primary tumor. In fact, you see a lot more, and it's a lot more clear because you don't have the non-neoplastic cells contaminating your analysis, the fibroblasts, the immune cells, et cetera. If you took another tumor and did that same approach, but instead of asking for gains and losses of DNA but sequenced the DNA, what would you find? Well, if you laser captured in the blue circle, and compared it to the organoid DNA in the red circle, almost everything you found by laser capture you would find in the organoid, and then you would double it. And so your ability to see mutations is many-fold increased in the organoids. And these are real mutations, not variants of unknown significance. These are cosmic database mutations. So you could ask, why? Is it because you're making mutations when you culture the cells? We don't think so. We can do it right from the fresh organoid prep before any cell divides? Or is it because you actually are sampling the whole tissue, which is what we favor? You're getting lots of clones, as it were, in your mix. So, so far, it looks promising. We have a lot more samples that we're processing. This is actually a, a project that we have uh, collaborative with, with, with Hans Cleaver, so we're looking for clonality in the organoids. What about testing drugs? Well, for pancreatic cancer, the drugs that are approved are all cytotoxic therapies. They're called gemcitabine. Taxol, the fancy version is Abraxane, Fulfirinox, which is four different uh, therapeutics, all um, small molecules which have been in uh, tr treatment for patients for many years. When you look at those types of drugs, the important thing is different organoids have different sensitivities, suggesting that one could find something uh, relevant by pursuing this. And so how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to determine whether this can help patients. Well, number one is we have to be really good at making organoids. If we get sent patients by Sandy or Kevin or any of you, we have to be really uh, act, uh, successful at getting that tissue, growing it rapidly, testing drugs, and finding molecular aberrations. And so this is a trial we have with Northwell Health, uh, supported by the Les Garden Foundation, where we have 50 patients going for surgery and 50 patients who don't qualify for surgery, where we're getting their samples, rapidly culturing them, exposing them to drugs in multi-well plates, and sending the samples also for sequencing. Our very modest criteria is we have to get it all done in five months per patient. 
Obviously, this is not on a time frame still that we're happy with. We want it to be five weeks, really five days, so that we can uh, move this forward. So we need technology development. And uh, so we are uh, engaged in that. And so now I'm going to give you uh, three brief vignettes of how we're using the organoids to go after those problems I delineated in the beginning. How can we use the organoids to find a way to kill these RAS mutant cells? So we want to kill the red cells and leave behind the green cells. So it turns out that the red cells are very sensitive to redox stress. So redox stress means the ability to regulate the levels of reactive oxygen species in a cell. We require oxygen to live. That's how our biology evolved on this planet. Uh, chiefly because in our mitochondria, oxygen becomes an electron acceptor, and uh, as we generate ATP, uh, that's how our engines work. Now, our engines don't work perfectly, which is important because we're warm-blooded and we need failure in our engines, uh, in our mitochondria, and in uh, reducing uh, oxygen. But cancer cells can't deal as well with failure in their engines as normal cells can. Reactive oxygen has both positive and negative effects in cells. The negative effect is that it oxidizes proteins, lipids, metabolites, nucleic acids, such that they're altered, changing the activity of those uh, biomolecules. What we found about 10 years ago, more, 15 years ago, is that reactive oxygen is very toxic to RAS mutant fibroblasts. With the organoids, we can then look at that um, in epithelial cells. And what Christine Chu, a very talented uh, gal in my lab, who's been with me about five years, did was use the organoids to study these pathways. And the pathways of reactive oxygen that she studied is the one that is probably most pertinent um, in uh, metazoans in terms of the regulation of reactive oxygen levels. That is the NRF2 pathway, which is a transcription factor which drives the synthesis of glutathione and influences the production of thioredoxin, which are the two main antioxidants which cells produce. She showed on a western blot on the bottom that the organoids, when they express RAS, made more NRF2 protein. And on the right, that's a histogram showing you that hydrogen peroxide levels build up when you're lo lost ne NRF2. So when you see the little N, you've lost NRF2 in the mouse. The amazing thing is what happened when she looked in the human. In the human, most human pancreatic cancer organoids die when you remove that transcription factor. They cannot tolerate the, the loss of that, of that transcription factor. Only a few survive, and that's important because she had something to study. And on the right is how much the hydrogen peroxide level goes up in those human organoids when you lose NRF2. And on the left are the organoids on the scramble, they're happy. If you deplete NRF2 with the SH NRF2, they're very unhappy, and actually the first two die, and the last one survives, which she studied. She asked, what were the proteins which were um, affected by this increased reactive oxygen levels? She developed a, a redox proteomics method with Daryl Pappen, a very talented uh, proteomics expert we have at Cold Spring Harbor. And she was able to use click chemistry to pull down reduced proteins because they had an intact sulfhydryl. And she would miss that if they were oxidized at various levels, either at the sulfinic, sulfinic, inic, or onic level, um, which are shown in the middle of the diagram. What she found was protein translation uh, components. So those proteins participating in mRNA translation were the top of her list when NRF2 was missing in mouse or human organoids that were depleted in NRF2. Many of them are listed here. They included ribosomal subunits, proteins involved in the initiation of, of translation, proteins involved in the elongation and the termination, and other regulatory proteins. She found that many of them could be reversed by just including an antioxidant, which suggested it was the first oxidation level that they were oxidized at. And then she performed lots of functional experiments showing that, in fact, translation was paused and shut down in these cells when NRF2 was missing. She translated this information or, or changed the, the knowledge she had into a, an effective therapy by including in cells a drug which inhibited glutathione synthesis and coupled that with a mitogen uh, signal transduction inhibitor, in this case an AKT inhibitor. When she did so, she was able to phenocopy NRF2 lost and kill pancreas cancer cells. So the red curve would be the sensitivity of pancreas cancer cells with this concoction of small molecules, no chemotherapy, 100-fold more sensitive when you were to include this, this pro-oxidant 
uh, BSO with an AKT inhibitor. She then could move that in vivo and showed a very uh, dramatic anti-cancer effect. And so she had a really a, a pathway which she's been able to identify through this work, which is shown here, where reactive oxygen is very important in cell biology, but is very toxic to pancreas cancers cells because it inhibits protein translation. Multiple targets shown below, and it inhibits mitogenesis shown above. And so it was a really new type of synthetic lethal approach for this disease, which led directly to some preclinical and now some clinical uh, trials to test her hypothesis. Um, and I'll show, uh, to the right is a very important point. RAS therapies that have been described in the past, most of them are ROS therapies. They block cysteine import, things like that. We think we understand why now. And so this may not be a, a perfect on-target RAS drug, but it is a way to de decompress or, or to demasculinate RAS to the point where it is not a potent oncogene. On the left, toxicity to normal tissues. This is a really important question that we don't know the answer to, um, because when you give a patient platinum or taxanes, peripheral neuropathy is commonly observed after chronic treatment. Obviously, we want a therapy that doesn't hurt the nerves but hurts the cancer. And so we're trying to devise very selective ways of, of doing this. So this is our way to go after RAS mutation using the organoids. What about identifying those patients early? How can we do this? Well, again, back to the picture. What we want is a way to see the red cells but not the green cells. An important thing about the organoids is everybody's proliferating. Normal pancreatic doppelt cells are proliferating, which you almost never see unless it's during the development of the pancreas or following damage to the pancreas, pancreatitis. So Danny Engel, extremely talented uh, postdoc in my lab, has been taking another proteomic approach to this problem, also working with Daryl uh, Papin. Carbohydrate antigen 19-9 is a biomarker of inflammation and neoplasia of the upper GI tract. This epitope, this glycan epitope, is due to the um, improper processing, immature termination of carbohydrate chains. And so on the bottom, you see some squares. The one to the right is a mature carbohydrate. We have Dicella Lewis A. The step before is called Sial Lewis A. That is CA199. And so Danny said, we'll use the organoids to discover CA199 biomarkers in cancer that aren't present in normal. And she's done that. But the second thing she's done is to use the mouse system to do this too. She had a huge problem to do that though because mice can't make those sugars. Mice are lacking those enzymes up front. And so first thing she had to do is humanize the mouse. She had to put those human enzymes into the mouse, make the organoids, and ask her question. And so on the left, before, and on the right, in green, after, turning on those enzymes to put CA199 on hundreds of proteins in the mouse organoids. Danny achieved on the very right-hand side of the slide, those are Western blots showing you basically a brilliant number of uh, proteins now have this glycan epitope. So working with Daryl, it's very straightforward to do an immunoprecipitation followed by mass spec to identify the core polypeptides that are affixed with the CA99 glycan epitope. And the important thing is she can subtract out the normal organoid input. And so she had a real control in her system, a proliferating normal compared to proliferating neoplasia. And so on the left, she has all kinds of proteins on the, on the um, color plots, all kinds of proteins which are present in normal. And, but on the right are all the proteins that are only present in the cancer. And so she found all kinds of putative CA199 carriers that may be relevant in humans. In the human, it's easier because they have the enzymes. 80 to 90 percent of humans have all the enzymes to make CA199. And so she could run Western blots on the left or study the levels on the right of CA199, do the same IP mass spec experiment you saw in the mouse, get the similar type of information. Then she could look in the blood. And so those proteins on the very top of the color plots are, are proteins called mucin-1, CD44, um, and LGAL3 uh, SBP. These were predicted to not distinguish cancer from obstructive jaundice, and Danny found that to be the case. Looking in the blood of patients, looking hard at those those various CA199 carrying proteins, none of them are biomarkers for cancer. They are a biomarker for proliferating ductal cell. And so she's able to debunk many that have been, I think, worked on in the past. Importantly, 
11 of the first 12 of these new guys have all scored in her assay. Seven from the mouse, four from the human. Looking hard in the blood of patients, um, comparing that to obstructive jaundice, either low levels of CA99 or high. And so this is really, I think, the first demonstration that one could push the organoids in a way to find potential biomarkers. She's following this up with uh, blinded experiments, getting uh, samples from Gloria Peterson at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, who has a very large biorepository of them. And if that, if that pans out, then there will be cross-validation by the EDRN network in the US. And then the last vignette I'm gonna uh, end with is how can we study the cricket ball? How can we study the hard rock pancreas cancer that when Kevin cuts out, he has to sharpen his blade five times to get the tumor out? How do we understand that biology? How can, we, how can we soften that tumor up to get our drugs in? It's a mystery, because you can't study that thing outside the in vivo context. So again, here's the picture of the organoid. I have a, a picture of four smiling uh, people to the right after they sent their paper in. And they've been trying to study this using the organoids. So uh, this is pancreas cancer. The cancer cells are these nests uh, that you can see here. My, my, my arrow's rubbish, but you can maybe see it here. These are the cancer cells. And all this swirly white stuff out here is not. This is the stroma. Extracellular matrix, collagens, laminins, fibronectin, immune cells, be they tumor macrophages or other myeloid cells, rarely are there lymphocytes there. And again, I, the whole talk I've been saying, well, how can we study this when we have all this stuff around? So. It turns out that when you take stellate cells, which are the resident fibroblast population in the pancreas and in the liver, if you take the pancreas stellate cells and mix them with the organoids, they go wild. And so again, in this cartoon, the, the organoids are in um, green and the stellate cells are these zany looking uh, red guys. And so when you mix them together, you can study things. The important point is shown here. So this is what the organoids look like by themselves, the epithelial cells. If you mix in the stellate cells, look at all this pink, pretty desmoplastic material that stains blue with mesons, trichrome, et cetera, that it has those proteins that you find in human and mouse uh, pancreatic cancer. And so this is the first model that I know of of stroma reconstitution in pancreas cancer. And what we know is that we now have a symbiotic relationship between the two cell types. So by that I mean you have cancer cells, in this case I'm making the cancer cells green, and these stellate cells which are red, that they're signaling to each other, and the stellate cells making the stroma. The cancer cells below proliferate in blue here, okay, but if I add the stellate cells, double the number of cancer cells through the organoids. The stellate cells don't proliferate a whole lot in the matrix gel, but if you add in the organoids, five tenfold more stellate cells. There's a synergistic proliferative burst, and you can then put them on bread and water. You can treat them like prisoners, and they don't mind. They will live on and on and on, on simple media, et cetera. And so this is a system we're now using to deconvolute what is that interaction between these two cell types? How is it that stroma is made? Using this model system now to test therapies, and to look for biomarkers like you saw in the, in the vignette before. Uh, has, has, it's, it's probably one of the most exciting things that we have uh, going on right now. And so in the beginning, I, I gave a slide. What are the problems we have in pancreatic cancer? It's a terrible disease, but there's only a few problems, okay? The main problem is the patients come so late that Kevin can only operate on you know, 10 out of 100. That's a huge problem. What if we could give him 90 out of 100? Well, that would help. He'd have to train more surgeons, though. Um, but that would be fine. So we can't diagnose the disease early. Huge problem. The second thing I said is Rasputin cells are hard to kill in vivo. That is true. So if you take Rasputin cells and you put them on a plastic dish, they don't look tougher than other cancer cells. But when they're in vivo, they are really tough. They are very hard to kill. These cells are, adapt very rapidly to the microenvironment they're in, develop interactions with that microenvironment that provides survival cues, be they physical or be they biochemical or be, be they immunological. Um, and then the final thing, challenge I, I gave for you is that pancreas cancer is also drug resistant, you know, due to those issues I, I just talked about, due to the stroma. 
So how are we gonna move forward? Well, we think, you know, it's like the real estate answer. Organoids, organoids, organoids. This is really a, a huge breakthrough. Um, I hope Hans and his uh, team get, you know, appropriate credit for what they did in that space. Um, and so we think the organoids are a royal comparator, which is, I guess, fitting since this is the Sheik Hamdan uh, conference and uh, prize. And the last quote is from an American who was uh, born a Christian and converted to uh, becoming a Muslim, uh, Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. So his quote was, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The hands can't hit what the eyes don't see. From Muhammad Ali in 1974 before he uh, beat the bejesus out of uh, Joe Frazier in the Thrilla in Manila, which I guess is not as far from here as it is from where I live. Um, and uh, Muhammad just uh, died this year. I didn't know him personally, although I um, was a fan of his. And so my last uh, statement for you is shukran uh, jazilan. Uh, from myself and my team, Hans and I have become a little bit of friends. Uh, he likes to go fishing. That's his blackfish. Uh, and uh, that's, my, that's one of my patients over here. And uh, she's, I guess, my patient advocate. Um, uh, really, this is a work that was uh, a tremendous collaboration internationally, as you could see uh, with our interaction with Hans, um, and uh, it really only happened with the tremendous support of the Les Garden Foundation, uh, the NIH through the MCI, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Stony Brook University, Northwell Health, Johns Hopkins, a variety of health systems uh, like that in the States who provide tissue and expertise, uh, and in my lab who are terrific and uh, their job is to put me out of work, and they haven't succeeded yet, but they're on their way. Um, we still have work to do. We still have to find that medicine for patients. Um, we have to get a, a way of diagnosing this disease that you know, really works, so that when you get your cholesterol checked, you get your cancer levels checked. Um, this is a problem not just for this disease, but for all. It's particularly germane, though, in pancreas and ovarian cancer, where it comes out of nowhere. Um, and uh, this provides a biological platform for clever people to make discoveries, and uh, I suspect there will be uh, many more uh, to be made in the days to come. Thank you again for your attention. I'm very honored to receive this, uh, this prize uh, here, and uh, I guess I have about two minutes left to answer some questions.